Coming up on TechZell, uh, free games, people. Byte Jacker's Anthony Carboni is back. We got, well, USB charging, your suggestions for home security cams, the best tablet PC to use on the farm, and a bunch of your viewer questions. So smoke that jerky and take a big bite, because TechZilla starts now. This episode of TechZilla is made possible by Squarespace, Netflix. Go to netflix.com slash TechZilla for a free trial membership. Carbonite Online Backup. Start your free 15-day trial at carbonite.com with the offer code TechZilla, and you'll get two months free with purchase. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to TechZilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner or tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or why tide pools really are more exciting than they sound, <laughs> we've got an answer for you. Tide pools are amazing. Tide pools are awesome. If you haven't been to a tide pool, just Google it. Actually, I hope that's a safe thing to Google. Tide pool? I, we know how like, I you, like, you search something a, innocuous and then your eyes pop out of your head? I don't think that is a euphemism for anything gross on the internet yet. <laughs> don't and if make it, is, it be one. We probably won't track down the expert that knows what it is. But other things, we love the experts. Um, hi. Welcome back. Welcome I, back. We been? missed you. <laughs> We, uh, we had a good time while you were gone, but not so much of a good time. We're happy to have you back. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> How was your trip? It was good. I, uh, I was actually shocked. XM Satellite Radio. Mm -hmm. I forgot how enjoyable that can be when you're like not into the one radio station. You can tune yeah. into the strange, obscure corner of the desert you're in. Mm -hmm. We went to Zion, Bryce, uh, Kodachrome Basin, uh, petroglyphs in Valley Fire State Park in Nevada. What's a petroglyph? A petroglyph? Yeah, is it like a, like a glyph that is petrified? That's close enough. Okay. <laughs> it was interesting. The one downfall, I, I used my iPad for all the navigation on this trip. Mm -hmm. um, like Navigon mostly, some TomTom, Tom, but uh, Scenic Maps uh, West, which is an application that's uh, topographic maps for the entire Western United States, beautiful vector graphics, GPS uh, integrated. The only downside is I couldn't get enough voltage out of the USB charging port in the vehicle we were in. Really? Because I was using it with the USB charging that synced it into the stereo so I could use oh. like the four billion songs I had stashed on the iPad. Interesting. But it was one of those things I was like, oh, iPad, we're going to charge a, charging stuff. We're going to talk about a little later in the show. Interesting. But USB... Universal standard, not so universal on the amperage. <laughs> yeah. PlayStation Network about. still down as of Monday. PlayStation blog repeated Monday, pretty much what they said a few days before. They don't have an update for the time frame when the PlayStation Network or Curiosity will be back online because basically they're rebuilding it and fixing security holes. I uh, did actually just see a tweet, really? not but five minutes ago, that said PSN is back for North America <gasps> and Canada and I think parts of Europe. Do I check the blog? It's not confirmed yet, but we'll we'll ch we'll check it out. I'm sure by the time you see this, it'll be back. It's we just hope. you know, it's it's been quite a process. It's funny, like because you know, last week, right? Amazon Web Services <laughs> basically took out Reddit, Quora, Foursquare, quite a few other websites. Uh, these are mostly resolved. The blogging and finger pointing, though, about well, if you were a real day online business person, you would have planned for a potential Amazon out and. Yeah. It's been crazy to watch people pointing back and forth about who's to blame. If it's the customer's fault, is it Amazon's fault? I know. It, the, the PSN thing combined with the Amazon thing, totally unrelated. But the Cloud fact that they fail. happened at the same time <laughs> was just like, man. I, I don't think they were related at all in terms of even being security issues. Because mm -hmm. I know PSN, I think, was. I don't have any kind of weird insider information or anything. <laughs> but they, uh, no one's taken credit for like hacking right. it yet. At least not as as of today, Monday. Um, but for the Amazon thing, it's just nuts because so right. many sites like totally rely mm -hmm. on their Because Amazon servers. works, it scales, it's easy, it's manageable. And then, except when it goes down, and then your whole company is screwed. Unless you've done, yeah. If you're interested in massive scaling services, you know who you are. You've probably been reading about this all week. Um, Dropbox. Do they have access to your data? Do they not? Do you even want to get into that right now? Uh, I haven't taken any of my stuff off of Dropbox. Can of worms to look into. I haven't either. But I think you, there's a way of encrypting that stuff too separately. Well, right? you can always We've encrypt your that. data before you post it to any online site, which is what you should do if you're extremely out of control paranoid. If you want us yeah. to talk about encrypting everything in your life, tell us. Otherwise, 
We'll just leave that to the paranoid people. White iPhone shipping this week, at least uh, to the stores, if not end users. Yeah, apparently some stores in Europe and in the UK especially got some white iPhones put on the shelves a little bit early, and then they took them back, and they're like, oops. <laughs> but they've got all the Jeez. SKUs for the white iPhones now that show them being different from the black iPhones. So you're going to sell your black iPhone and get a no. white iPhone? No. <laughs> No. This, the white iPhone is just going to get dirty and gross looking, I bet. No, well, the white's on the inside of the Gorilla Glass, not like oh, okay. the You're skanky. Right. And I know I should take this to the Apple, or have you know the IT department take this to the Apple store and get the non-grimy. White is a bad color for technology, almost as bad as shiny black. I tend to think so. Everybody's, by the way, so excited about the Wii 2 release promo tease later this year. They're barely mentioning Nintendo profits down 66% this year from Ouch. last year. Mario's going to come back swinging because they're going to do an HD. I, I, I blame it all on the Wii being SD and not HD, which is a sign of how little I know Or maybe about everyone's gaming. just got their hands on a Wii already. <gasps> Our first question today comes from Sam. Sam writes, try not to make fun of me, but can you recommend a sort of USB power strip? I just saw the episode with Patrick talking about swivel surge protectors. Most of my stuff connects via USB to a brick. Can I eliminate all those bricks? I would like one for my iPad, iPhone 3GS, Samsung Fascinate, Motorola i1, Jabra Halo, and PS3 headset, Sam T. I think if you take out the iPad, all those devices can be standard, powered by a standard USB port. The iPad, two amps over USB for all intents and purposes. So was that your problem too? Yeah. Pulling too, trying to pull too much power from, from your yeah. USB port? Yeah, and my Sprint Overdrive modem does the same thing. I think it's like 1.5. It might be powerful enough to, it's basically, here's the thing, right? Standardization of micro USB is probably going to make this worse over time for, for more powerful devices, right? Because the EU is like, we want a standard connector for all cell phones, so fine, we'll do micro USB. And then, but the problem is, is you see micro USB, you think, oh, a USB port, a USB port of power. And a USB port won't do anything more than 500 milliamps. USB mm. hubs, by the way, can have bigger power issues, right? Because in theory, <laughs> you know, you've got 100 milliamps. You plug into USB, you get 100 milliamps. There's a handshake. You might get 500 milliamps per USB port. Right? But what it's about a, what a, about a powered max. USB port? That's the problem. Is a lot of cases I buy a hub mm -hmm. and I get like a one amp power supply for a hub with seven ports. I just filled the last of my like eight port <laughs> USB hub, so I'm starting to get a little concerned about all my devices that are charging on them. Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's some dedicated USB charging devices. Uh, Belkin's Conserve Valet Energy Saving USB Charging Station, which is just a horrendously long name for an interesting product. Uh, it might work for you if you leave out the iPad, right, because it, it does, it has, I think, four ports, all of which support 500 milliamps, which is great for uh, a normal USB device, uh, or I should say, normal USB power charging situation, uh, it costs under forty bucks. You find it for like thirty-eight bucks at Walmart. The problem is it shuts down automatically after four hours and doesn't start back up until you plug something else into it. It's on a timer for all intents and purposes. So if your phone does a lot of pinging or you left the GPS running or just takes like seven hours to charge, the battery will not be fully charged when you wake up the next morning because you will, you know, you'll plug it in and four hours later the Belkin shuts itself down because it's mm. done charging everything because it's saving energy. Gotcha. Um, and then I remember call pods charge pod, which for some reason I have to say very slowly or it turns into a call pods call pod. Call pods charge pod? Call pod? Exactly. Call, call pods pod, charge pod. pod. Call pods charge pod? Sherpa? It's, well, it'll Did charge. Well, it's kind of the perfect device for you. It'll charge six devices at once. It's this little flat disc, plugs into the wall. It's got little ports you can plug your your adapters into. This is the universal sign for plugging in adapters before people start Certainly. snickering at home. Um, I was already snickering. It's 60 bucks with three adapters. You'll have to probably spend about 75, 80 bucks to get all the, the adapters you need for all your devices. But I am assured by people online, I didn't think it would charge an iPad because of that gigantic amperage draw, but apparently it will charge the iPad and all the other devices plugged into the call pod charge pod. Notice the I'm call saying call pod <laughs> Exactly. It's a sure bet. So that, that would be an answer for you. You'll, you'll just have this like, you know, bag full of your little dongles on your call pod charge pod. Call, call pod, <laughs> no, say it, I can't. Call pod charge pod. 
Call Spell Pod it? Charge Pod. Call Pod Charge Pod. This is like our Call version. Pod Charge you know, Pod? I was watching the King's Speech last night on Blu-ray, uh -huh. and this really feels like moments in that movie. Michael wrote in to correct us about a comment I made back in episode 209. He writes in, I noticed on episode 209, Patrick Norton had said Firewire was faster than gigabit Ethernet. Isn't Firewire on computers still either 400 or 800 megabits per second? Michael. In Don't California. use the smart guy voice on him. Oh, I'm using the smart guy voice. The smart guy. Uh, first <laughs> off, he was talking about the real world performance of the gigabit network in his old office, not theoretical speeds. Um, second, yep, Firewire is uh, 400 or 800 megabits per second, not megabytes. Figure roughly 8 megabytes per second is a theoretical top speed for Firewire. Gigabit Ethernet can hit real world speeds of over 100 megabytes per second, so it should kick Firewire's posterior. Correct? Right, it's sure. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. Imagine if your office network is automatically backing up a few dozen machines, mm. handing the YouTube ha handling the YouTube habit of the receptionist Over. and the BitTorrent <laughs> habit of the dude that's supposed to be programming the automated TPS reports. Mm. And you get slower real world speeds for your transfer. Yeah, it, it, was, it was literally, it, it was my office, the office we were in. It took, we had a Firewire drive, we had a gigabit Ethernet network. That it, was an uneven episode number, so I don't think I was on that one. Yeah. It, so I'm well, learning this for the first time. It was basically like, we, in theory, we were like, you know, we were, we, were, we were moving these huge, like, eight gigabyte files from, you know, we, we made the video, then it had to go to multiple machines to render the video before we could post it online. Mm -hmm. um, it would take like an hour and a half to transfer the video over the gigabit ethernet versus like 30 minutes to do it with the firewire drive because there was so much other activity right unless you have a gig unless you have a dedicated network that's just like that video that giant file transferring everything that's going on in the network can potentially impact your file transfer. Mm. In this case, there's mm -hmm. just a whole lot of stuff going on in that particular node of the network and we could never get anything approaching theoretical real world top speeds for gigabit, much less yeah. Ethernet, much less theoretical top speeds. On a related but unrelated note, <laughs> I've, I've been playing around with the MiFi, uh, the, the new MiFi mm -hmm. that I got, and I was testing the download and upload speeds using speed tests, which is right. kind of wonky for, for a, um, you know, a separate a, a modem like right. that anyway. Um, and I was getting faster upload speeds than download speeds. And I think the reason was is because there's so much other network activity going mm -hmm. on that it, it makes that unbalanced and you're getting faster upload instead of download. I was talking to Will Smith about it actually and he was like, yeah, that's probably why. I've run into that a lot. It was actually kind of funny because I, I was in situations because, you know, I'm traveling, I'm in these very small towns and I was laughing because I'd get like five bars of connectivity and I'd be not able to actually you know, do my Google Maps, and then, you know, it's, <laughs> I, and I'm like, what's going on here? So well, that happens at any big tech conference. Yeah, you have five bars of, of connectivity, but yet you don't get anything actually going through. But if I can see the cell tower, and there's like eight people in the surrounding ten square miles, shouldn't I at least the tubes get are clogged? Uh, the tubes are clogged. Reality, theory, and your particular situation—they all tend to vary. You no, know, it doesn't vary. Squarespace, one of our sponsors, we love them. They're a publishing system for anybody looking to build a blog, a portfolio, a website. Squarespace has really slick tools. They're flexible. You don't need any coding experience to build an amazing high-end website. You know, you, you look at a website, you think like, they must have spent millions on this. Squarespace is going to help you deliver the kind of functions you get on some of the biggest, highest traffic pages on the web, including, by the way, many of Revision 3's well-known personalities like Alex Albrecht and Jeff Kanata. Squarespace just pushed a brand new social widget for geolocation services. You can display your most recent check-ins from Foursquare, Gowalla, Facebook Places on a live Google map right on your website, and it's stupid easy to implement. You want to find out more about Squarespace and how they can make your presence online even slicker than it already is? Go to squarespace.com slash techzilla and you'll get a two-week free trial and learn quite a bit more about Squarespace, one of our sponsors. Please support them. Portal 2, what's new on Steam? Forget that, ByteJacker's Anthony Carboni is back to bring us more free games to kill Patrick's free time, and probably mine too. Um, I understand that you introduced Patrick and his son to Tiny Wings, Anthony. At least it's something that I introduced an entire family to, as opposed to introducing one member of a family to Tiny Bringing Wings. Bringing them together. And then they disappear and neglect their family for weeks and weeks, which is what will happen that if you start playing That almost never happens. It. That almost Tiny never Wings happens. got real bad. 
the I'm tiny wings. I haven't for me. played Tiny Wings. You haven't? No. Don't, I don't want to know. Don't start if you have a busy week. I've got other stuff going on. Um, so what are your favorites this week, by the way? Oh man, there there have been so many good ones recently. Uh, the big the big game that I'm playing uh, lately is Clash of Heroes HD uh, on PSN and XBLA. I don't know if you if you tried that yet. I it's uh, it's by Cappy, the people who just recently made like a huge splash with Sword and Sorcery for the iPhone, right? Yeah. Um, this is a remake of a DSi game that they made about a year ago, and it's a fantasy puzzle game. So it's an RPG slash puzzle game together. It's kind of really awesome. So you're traveling around your overworld, you're getting knights and archers and all your units together, mm -hmm. but then when you play, it's on like a puzzle field. And so you're trying to align archers to get them to attack, kind of like in Tetris. Okay, so when you were describing it, it kind of sounded to me like a plants versus zombies kind of thing. Right. But instead of, of plants, it's archers, or is it kind of sim that? kind of similarly? It, it plays more like a um, like a columns or a Tetris or something like that crossed with an RTS. So you have these archers and these wizards and everything. When you line them all up and they're the same color, they get ready to attack. Mm -hmm. And then three turns later, they actually attack. So there's strategy because your opponent's army is on the other side lining up and trying to attack you as well. It's just an absolutely beautiful game, and it's a really interesting kind of new take on fantasy and puzzlers. Oh, very cool. And although everyone seems to be fixed on Portal 2 or Mortal Kombat, it's kind of easy to forget that you can get plenty of gaming entertainment from titles that don't cost an arm and a leg, for that matter. Um, so what is what is Super Crate Box? Super Crate Box is awesome. Super Crate Box was created by two Dutch game design students, and it is a game where you're in kind of an 80s-style arcade platform environment, single screen, and all these enemies are dropping down, these monsters are coming from a chute at the top of the screen. Uh, but instead of winning by killing enemies, you win by picking up weapon crates. So the way this works is you may pick up your first crate and it's got a machine gun. And you're like, great, I'm mowing all these guys down with a machine gun. But you have to pick up the next crate. You have no choice if you want to advance. And the next crate, Maybe you get a knife. Like a banana. Yeah, it's like, it's really terrible. So you'll have a rocket launcher, and then it's like you'll have an 1800s pistol. That's like, great. And the whole thing gets really frantic, because the longer you're on a level, the more enemies it starts throwing at you. And the crazier the weapons get, you unlock all kinds of new costumes for your character. And they're random as well. You don't get to choose what your character looks like. So you may have a really cool, badass-looking character, and then you get an afro. That takes like all the awesome parts about customization in video games and just throws it out the window. Throws it out the window. You're like, just oh, like, you, like, you like choosing your hair and, your, and how your face looks, or you like choosing your outfit style or the color of your cape. No, now you're, you're an astronaut alligator. That well, can actually happen in the game. At least there's choices. Mm -hmm. At least there's some variety thrown in there. What else you got? Uh, Photonica, which is a really amazing game. And most people don't think about browser games as being things that can be fully 3D and really amazing looking. This is going to be really fun for people who are big into Mirror's Edge. Oh, So yeah. it's a first person running game. Cool. But it has a very psychedelic sort of look to it. So if you ever played anything like Res, or uh, Tempest X. Mm -hmm. It's got that really kind of crazy vector special effect look to it, and you just keep running faster and faster, and you have to get through these crazy platform courses. And it's actually very easy to control because it's kind of a, a single switch game. So all you do is press spacebar to jump. It's kind of like if Cannibal was 3D through your own eyes. So you don't have to deal with any of that kind of crazy like parkour stuff like you do with Mirror's Edge? No, no. This no one's timing. straight Is it speed. timing? There's definitely a lot of timing, but there's not a lot of that kind of acrobatic stuff. This one's straight run through, gain speed, get to the end as quickly as you can. Any other good browser games you've been looking at? Oh, man. I don't know about... So this one is good bad because it's good bad. It's good bad because it's so frustrating. I don't know if you remember a, a game that came out a while ago for the iPhone called Quop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> how can you forget a name like that? Cannot forget Quop. Quop was the game where when you're running, you're controlling every single muscle in your runner. So you had to move left thigh, move right. You know, it was it was terrible. It was it was so frustrating. Uh, Bennett Foddy, who created that, is back with another game called GURP because that's Girl. what he does. That's the name of actually one of my friends in my World of Warcraft guild. Really? Scott Johnson, who does the Instance podcast, his, his main character's name is Gerp. Gerp. Although I think it's spelled differently. It's G-E-R-P. Yeah, this is G-I-R-P. So it's kind of grip, but not really. And the whole deal is you are rock climbing. And in this one, you control your arm muscles. And not only your arm muscles, but every rock has a different letter on it that corresponds to a button on your keyboard. So if you've ever been real rock climbing, you know that like 
three handholds maybe around you, and you have to kind of choose one. And as you start choosing your handholds, you get very twisted around and kind of in these impossible positions. Mm -hmm. And so that's what GURP does by making you kind of push your fingers all over the keyboard at once to climb <laughs> up this wall. It gets super frustrating, but it's not as frustrating as Quop was. It plays a little bit more like a game mm -hmm. and not like somebody is playing a joke on you. I like so it that's how it's, good. it's like twister for your fingers. It really is. At one point, I look down at my hands on the keyboard and I'm just like this and I'm like, what have I done to myself? <laughs> not so and good where for do I go from here? RSI. Injuries, no, I would imagine. I would take a break every 15 minutes, everyone. Yeah. Use a gel pad. Use a gel pad. <laughs> so I hear you're actually working on a gaming machine or a gaming system with the Hack 5 and, and Ben Heck. It's actually, I'm, I'm working with, uh, with Hack 5 and mm -hmm. then Dylan from Household Hacker. Okay. Um, and we are building a Winatron. A which Winatron? Is, a Winatron. So the Winatron is an arcade platform that was created by these guys in Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, and it's basically a free-to-play indie game filled arcade machine. So it's got something like 30 titles on it right now. Anybody can build one. All you do is go to the Winatron website and let them know that, hey, I have an arcade cabinet. I've started building. Give me the software. And they send it to you for free. Install it wherever you want. It connects to the internet, downloads new games, shares scores with the world. It's going to be really, really amazing. Are you going to uh, have it here in the office? Uh, for a little while. It's actually the cabinet is back here in the office in the workshop right now. Yeah. Yeah, and I got uh, I got Dylan and uh, and Darren to help me out, so I don't die of electrocution. Yeah. So what's the, what's the barrier <laughs> to entry here? Is it really hard to make? What's what's the hard part of doing this? Building the cabinet. This is going to be my first arcade cabinet build, mm -hmm. so um, I'm a little intimidated. But it's basically, from what I understand, taking the the cabinet internals, like the monitor and the control surfaces, and getting them to a point where you can plug them in via USB and get them understood by a PC that's inside the cabinet. Um, which is like crazy dark magic to me. <laughs> so. All right, well, you'll have to show it off once you get it all finished. Once Absolutely. Once it's in, in perfect working order. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. I'm going to have to download some of those games. And uh, don't forget to catch more of Anthony on Bite Jacker right here on Revision 3. There's more Techzilla coming right up, but before we do that, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Netflix. With more than 20 million members, Netflix is the world's largest subscription service, instantly streaming TV episodes and movies over the internet and sending DVDs by mail. Members can instantly watch thousands of titles on a vast array of devices, streaming TV episodes and movies, like Microsoft's Xbox 360, Sony's PS3 game console, and the Nintendo Wii console. As a Netflix Unlimited member, you can instantly watch as many movies as you want, anytime you want, for one low monthly price. There are no late fees or due dates. As a new member and a Techzilla viewer, you can get a free trial membership. Go to Netflix.com slash Techzilla and sign up now. Be sure to use this URL so they know we sent you. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, myedu.com. If you're heading to college soon, or if you just need a hand planning out your next semester, check out myedu.com. This site gives you everything you need to make sure you're on track with your major, lets you rate professors, and even gives you deals on textbooks that you need. Nice. First, sign up for an account. My alma mater, Emerson College, isn't fully listed on the site yet, unfortunately, but we'll test it out with UC Berkeley. To add courses, either enter in their course number or name, or browse the listed classes. You'll see the class pop up on your calendar after you select which version of the lessons you're taking. It really helps with time management. You can see the rating of the professor, the average grades and drop rates of students in the class, and what textbooks you'll need for this particular course, and where to buy them online. There's so much more here, too. You can connect with other students in your class, put together your resume, and even have them help you with a career plan that fits your interests. If you're not in college yet, MyEDU will help you pick the right one for you. Check it out today and get prepared for the future now at MyEDU.com. Speed round! Brandon has a sad but fascinating question. He ponders, so yeah. I bought an iPad 2 for someone, but they broke up with me before I could give it to them. Oh. oh. I suppose I could sell it, but that wouldn't be any fun. I was wondering if it would be possible to swap the A5 processor into my iPhone 4. I realize I would need software to take advantage of this upgrade, but I'll manage. So on the hardware side of things, is this possible? Brandon in Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. Uh, by the way, Brandon, sorry about the breakup, but we never liked her anyway. Mm -mm. No. There's words we could mention, but no. not in a family. Not a nice show. girl. A4, A5, and of course, if he gets back together with her, I've... he's going to be really ticked at us and never speak to us again. It, 
A4, A5, short answer, no. The A5 is like twice the size of the A4, and it's got a lot more of those nifty little flip chip solder balls. Uh, basically, the little the attachments on the bottom, mm -hmm. it's insane. You, one, you'll never get it unsoldered, and if you do, you'll never get it soldered back up again. And if you do, Without there's actually it. <laughs> more pins on the A5 than there are on the A4 from everything I've seen. Um, and there's like, it's a different motherboard, there's going to be battery life problems because there's a reason they put like 42 batteries inside the iPad 2 case instead of one relatively tiny pad or battery in the, in the iPhone. No, just sell the iPad, wait for the next generation iPhone. Or, you or, know. or, huh? Save it for the next girl. Ooh. Huh? Or huh? send it for Veronica. No, I don't need it. You don't need no, it? I don't need an iPad. Give my old one to my mom. You could say, auction it off for charity. Or send it to, uh. Give it to someone she hates. Yeah, give, give it to her best friend or put it on Gazelle. Mm. Give it to her best friend. What am I thinking? I'm trying to start stuff over there. Well, I'm a little troublemaker. That's because you're in a solid, secure relationship. I'm a little troublemaker. <laughs> Jake wrote and asked about tablet PCs. He says, I manage my family's farm in Minnesota, and I'm hoping to upgrade from my Magellan Explorers 210 to a tablet PC. It would be a business expense, so money isn't too big of an issue, but I'm not willing to drop 3800 bucks on Ooh. Trimble's industry-specific Yuma, which is this really swift, it's, it's a really cool, like, Trimble's trying to go for the people who run around in the dirt and want a computer. It's a pretty cool. Okay, that's not me, but okay. It's, he says, I'm not an Apple person and I'm not considering any tablets that are designed around cell phone service. Instead, I'd be doing everything over Wi-Fi. I thought I'd found the perfect fit with the Asus eSlate EP121, but was disappointed to find out GPS was not built in. The two pro programs I'd be using the most are Google Earth and Microsoft Office. Are there any tablets I've overlooked or are there any coming out soon that are worthy of waiting for or is the eSlate my best option? I'd love to hear your thoughts, Jake. Okay, first of all, I gotta say, Windows 7 on a tablet is not my favorite. I haven't even tried it, really. Office, well, I, I guess I've, you need the Office Suite, so. Yeah, if, if man, and that's the other problem is, is the Office Suite begs for a keyboard and a mouse. You can do it with the on-screen keyboard, right, if you're just doing minor stuff, but if you're used to being able to type fast, you're not gonna do it on a tablet. The Asus eSlate is sucktastic in terms of battery life. I've heard like three hours oh, in the world. That's terrible. Yeah, that's maybe maybe. You're gonna be cranking along with the Wi-Fi too. That's like. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't stuff. have the GPS. Dell's got some interesting tablets coming later this year. Uh, but the Inspiron convertible tablet is out now. It's an atom-powered netbook, essentially, with a screen that flips over, starts at 550 bucks. Mm -hmm. So just so I can tell, there's no onboard GPS for that, so you'd be using, a, like, a USB dongle. HP's Windows Slate 500, which finally shipped for 800 bucks. Uh, the optional GPS module for it seems to be missing in action. Uh, HP is really all about the webOS now with the acquisition of Palm. Yeah, and then Dell's got uh, more um, wind tablets coming later this year. The, the Dell 10-inch uh, Latitude ST will have Windows and GPS. That's, that's not until October, but that would, that would give him everything he needs. Like 10 inch should have decent battery life, should have the GPS option. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is most of the 10 inch, nine inch light power efficient tablets with GPS built in are gonna be iOS or Android and have 3G functionality. Well, at least money's no object, so we can kind of be a little choosy. I would almost say, I know you don't wanna buy an iPad, but I would really say, Try an iPad because there's so many applications. You can probably find something that'll work with your, with your need Microsoft. Doesn't he Office? Well, if you can find an application that'll deal just fine. Well, you with could this do Microsoft you could do pages and yeah. get docs in there. Yeah. 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 I guess. It's, or you could wait. Uh, I would. I would maybe wait a little while. <laughs> this see I what mean, shakes out of the yeah. tablet tree. I mean, more stuff is going to be coming out soon, and right. and. There's always CES. The problem is, it's kind of funny because so <laughs> many of the- That's a terrible idea, don't wait for CES. So many of the Windows tablets don't offer the Windows, like the Windows 7 tablets either have horrendous battery life, because like the, the, the reason the, 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 the Asus the Asus e-tablet is has such horrendous battery life because it's got like an i5 processor, so it's got blazing speed. Mm -hmm. And if you have a truck that you can keep it plugged into all the time, or, or a tractor, or whatever you're driving it on, then you're great, right? You just use the vehicle as the battery. But if you need to actually carry it around and use the battery life, the battery life's not so good. Well, if anyone out there has any suggestions too, we'd love to hear from you. Texilla at revision3.com. <laughs> from the one more problem with Win7 drivers department, Thoughts of Knowledge asks, is there any way that I can get Creative Lab sound Blaster, XTG, and Windows 7 to work together? Thoughts of knowledge. 
The product you have selected has been classified as end of service life. Oh. That always sucks to read on the top of a support page. Um, short answer is if you plug it into Windows 7, if it's a USB device, you plug it into Windows 7, like an audio device uh, or, a, or, a, or a webcam or something. If you plug it into Windows 7 and it doesn't work, you're probably out of stuff. Uh, what uh, about going into the like XP like uh, yeah. compatible mode and using admin rights to install it? Or? I, I I I spent a bunch of time on Google looking at this one because um, the short answer is like it's end of life. You're done. They haven't done anything Windows since Windows XP. Creative hasn't. I've heard of people going into the, the, the compatible mode using admin rights and using the program compatibility troubleshooter. There was a hot fix download for USB audio devices for Vista. Um, you could try those. It's pretty you know. You know, Windows supports hot fix USB audio devices. You can try. You dig that. around a little bit. Yeah. I think you're doomed, though. If it's not working, you're probably doomed. Because USB audio devices, they work, they don't work. And if they're anywhere Mine in between those two. Mine love to cause kernel panels, kernel hmm. panics. Pa what did I just say? What was that word I just said? Oh, the panic, panic kernel. That sounds panics. like a really good name for a band. It does. Up next, panic kernel. <laughs> <laughs> Mihail in Bulgaria emailed us asking, what's the best solution for cleaning my laptop screen? It's a glossy one. If that matters, it does. I got to say, 90% of the time when I'm cleaning my notebook screen, it involves oh, and the bandana. Disgusting. Fortunately, <laughs> yes, it is disgusting, but it is highly effective. Um, You're like a mom spitting on her baby's face. You're well, like, usually, yeah, spit on your hand first. And then <laughs> you wipe just the, spit right on their no, face. You don't no. just spit on their face? No, no, if you spit on your they hand, don't like that. then wipe the snot off, you don't get that look. From I, I guess I don't have those plane. maternal instincts. I'm just like, patooey. <laughs> wipe, wipe. <laughs> You're clean now, child. Um, I like clear screen wipes when I'm feeling fancy. I, I keep a couple of these in my bag most of the time. Um, but seriously, uh, if there's dust, use microfiber cloth. Mm, um, that's what I usually use. You know, you can get it, you know, you can get it lightly wet, squeeze all the moisture out if there's a little bit of schmutz on it. Um, alcohol, rubbing alcohol. My favorite 90% rubbing alcohol will help if you've got like peanut butter or, or somebody spilled a beer on it or something like Good that. Good to know. So, but spit in the bandana. Does it matter if it's glossy or, or matte finish? Not so much. Most of the, the surfaces are all pretty. You, what you want to do is avoid uh, using ammonia. What you really want to avoid is spraying a lot of stuff on the mm. screen and then wiping it off. My spitting on the screen aside. Um, the Because uh, the last thing you want to do is like spray, like get your Windex on and have the Windex like eat the coatings on the screen yeah. and then dip down into the bottom of the uh, LCD flat panel and seep in and start, you know, shorting things out. Just very sparing if you use any liquid, use very little of it, and apply it to the wiping rag, which by the way, the, the bandana's cotton, it could potentially scratch the screen. Use a proper microfiber cloth. So don't do anything Patrick just told you, yeah. except the second things he told Although, you, I'll not the first you, things. The bandana, it works. Just use a softer bandana. A microfiber bandana, for example. <laughs> Still to come, your suggestions for networked home security cameras. But first, it's time to thank one of our sponsors, Carbonite. Computer disasters eventually happen to everyone, but if you get Carbonite Online backup before your disaster, then no need to worry because your files will be backed up automatically and safely off-site, and it's really easy to get them back. Plus, you get anytime, anywhere access to your backed up files from any computer or on your smartphone or iPad with a free Carbonite app. With Carbonite, unlimited backup for your PC or Mac is just $59 a year. That's less than five bucks a month. But when you use the offer code TEXILLA to start your free 15-day trial, you'll get two months free if you decide to buy. All the details are at Carbonite.com, and remember to use the offer code TEXILLA to get two months free with purchase. Last week, we highlighted Google's plan to shut down the Google Video Service and imploring to people to download their videos. Well, it seems that Google has backtracked on that original plan, and viewer Keith writes in with an update. He says, your last broadcast alerted me to the Google Video shutdown. However, things are changing so fast, I can't keep up. I see Google has removed the deadline and has provided a simple transfer to YouTube and promises an automatic one in the near future. Could you please clarify the following for us? One of my Google videos was 36 minutes. However, it transferred to my linked YouTube account in total. Does that mean YouTube is really accepting long Google videos or will it mysteriously truncate someday? <laughs> Will the Google embed code remain good forever? That is, will we or will we not be required to change the embed code for each transferred video? This note was on the YouTube blog. Friday, April 22nd. If you choose this option, we'll do our best to ensure your existing Google video links continue to function. Thank you. Keith in Lodi, California. 
Uh, yes, it's true. Google has reversed its decision uh, to force users to either download their Google videos or risk losing them forever. <laughs> um, now, as Keith noted, there's a button that will automatically send the video to your YouTube account, or you can choose to leave them on the Google video service. As for the length, there are probably two options. Um, either your account is one of the fortunate accounts that YouTube has allowed to stream longer videos, um, though probably if that was the case, you would already know it, because they usually send out an email or right. tell you, we're inviting you to this director's program. I'm, I'm one of those members. I don't know why. I don't have very many videos on YouTube, but... That one think, you posted was like three hours long, though. Which one? Oh, sorry. That wasn't... You didn't post that one. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not mentioning it. Um, no links. Yeah, you would probably know already. What one? I'm not... No? You were saying. I was saying. <laughs> um, or they're just allowing uh, those Google videos to exist as is on YouTube, which is what I'm guessing. I'm, they're probably saying, probably hey. It's probably simpler to just do that. Considering they have like 42 billion data centers with. 40... They're not just going to like truncate a video, right. and they're not just going to like break it up into separate videos. I don't think they've really. Care, care that much to, to deal with that. <laughs> um, yeah, so it seems to me the most likely option is they're just transferring them over, leaving them as is. Um, like I said, be extremely surprised if it was anything else. Finally, it appears that your embeds will continue to work as they currently do. Yes. Um, if Google says the links will continue to work, then the embed code should really just stay the same right. as well. Um, for future proofing it, though, it may not be a bad idea to use the transfer button and then change your embed codes to YouTube when you get the chance on your blog post or wherever else you're hosting video. It's not going to hurt. It's just going to be a good idea in case they ever do decide to go bat poop crazy and disappear at all. Just kill Google Video out of nowhere like they tried to. Well, yeah. it, no, it, it's funny. It's, it, this is also sort of a reminder that, hey, you know, just because you post videos on. I, I guess Nothing is permanent on the internet. Right. You do not have really any control over whether or not a company <laughs> decides to just wipe all your content at the Tip of a hat. GeoCities. And, and it's kind of funny. Like, it's, I think the saddest thing is when, yeah, they, they made it abundantly aware for months and everybody has a chance to move or migrate or download or whatever the options are. But, you know, the links still point to the non existent website or service or photo hosting thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's late. And then you're like reading through forums, you go to a link and it's like. That's how the internet gets broken. Yes. <laughs> link URL shorteners and companies just going kaput. And then the content isn't there anymore. Or being acquired. Or link shortener companies going kaput. <laughs> Combine the two. Speaking of kaput, Brian and his sibling are looking to get their tech resistant mother some better sound for her new HDTV. He asks, My brother and I have a mother. <laughs> well, in theory, so do we all. Um, she's very particular about what sorts of electronics she'll have sitting out in her home and how they're set up. She's one of those folks that insists on stretching the picture to fill a whole widescreen. We just replaced her CRT with a new LCD and I now find myself really missing my surround sound system in my house whenever I try to watch anything at hers. A real surround system is right out of the question, so what would you recommend to get decent sound? I assume that I need to be looking at a sound bars, but both my brother and I are having a hard time figuring out what the right one to get would be. For price constraints, assume that we're definitely operating within a thousand dollars and cheaper is always better hey Brian brother with the same mother <laughs> something um, props for getting your mom into the wonderful world of LCD TVs mm -hmm. uh, HD TV especially I'm curious why a surround sound system is right out of the question though cables multiple speakers okay. behind the divan not acceptable in my house well I mean has she heard the one at your house I mean it probably sounds really good there are some great home theater in a box options out there that look great and won't break the budget. And if you're a good son, you will show her how to wire it correctly and keep the wires out of the way and put them well, under the right but that, carpet. Well, depending on the how, if you're in an apartment, okay. if you're in concrete floors, you get a area rug. And I have an area rug you with a with a flat wire system underneath it, which now has a quarter inch hump anyway. that my son has tripped over twice. Beside so that, the point. Well, well, it sounds like all her kids are grown up; they're not going to be tripping over nothing. Well, here's the thing, though: for some people, drilling through the floor or even putting as painful as some all people right. will just fight the speakers in the back. There Fine. are there's, there are some cool wireless surround speaker options that aren't too bad. Fine. Well, anyway, sound bars yeah. for those of you out there familiar with the term um, are speakers. One speaker, really, that create a, it's a simulated. Rectangle. It's it's a rectangle. <laughs> it's like it's like a oval sometimes, sometimes, like a long elongated oval. Sits under your television. It sits under your television. Um, they create simulated surround sound um, sometimes, or just higher quality sound than a traditional, you know, just 
two like two bot one system. Yeah, the, the they try to simulate like high quality. They're they're better than the speakers you get under your TV, basically. Yeah. Um, most still need an AV receiver to operate a subwoofer sometimes. Um, though there are some self-powered models that work just fine without those things. Um, fortunately, most of them are well under your 1K budget. Um, Polk Audio makes a lot of good models, including the Polk Audio Surround Bar 50, which you can find online for like 720 to 750 dollars. You'll need an AV receiver and a subwoofer for that one, and at that price, you may as well get the rest of the speakers for the 5.1 <laughs> system. Um, the Sony HT CT150 is less expensive at around 300 dollars, and it has three HDMI inputs and a subwoofer included. The Harman Kardon SB16 comes with a subwoofer too and falls in the middle of those two price points at about 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, Harman Kardon's pretty good. Do be aware that you will not get the same sound quality from any of these compared to a true 5.1 or 7.1 system, in my opinion. You, uh, you can get fantastic sound quality. You are not going to feel these, the, the, it will not magically make the sound sound like it's coming from behind you. No matter what they say on the box. Exactly, yeah, right. But, but, the, but the actual, in, in terms of the audio quality, especially if it comes with a box subwoofer, the audio quality is it coming out of it. It will sound better than the speakers on your TV. Yes. It will never sound as good as a true 5.1 system. In terms of surround sound. In, tr in terms of surround sound, and I would argue probably quality as well. Yeah, some of, some of them are better than most of them. I mean, the the truth is, is mom's going to say no to a 5.1 system to receiver. Like, go to Costco, get the Vizio sound bar for 300 bucks. You'll be happier. They, do that too. they just take know. up a lot less room. I mean, they yeah. have a very small footprint. If if your your TV is already on a nightstand, it should be able to fit a sound yeah. bar in front of it. If your TV's up on the wall, it's super easy. To yeah. Handle. All right, well, Monty in New Jersey wrote in last week about wanting some security cameras now that he has incoming twins, danger. Um, you guys wrote in with your responses. It takes a village, after all. I, I wasn't here for this. Is he having, like, is he getting, like, twin cousins that are, like, 16 and he's afraid of them attacking? No, he's or having small? twin babies, one of which he is sure is his. Margretha wrote in to suggest her D-Link camera. Hi, I've been using the D-Link DCS930L, my D-Link enabled wireless and network camera for about five months and love it. They only cost about $75 at Amazon.com. They have motion detection, low light features, email still shots, upload still shots or video to FTP and have both iPhone and Android apps to view off site. The software also allows for multiple cameras. I think up to 16, I found it to be a great option. Hmm. Not bad. Yeah. And then Adam has some pros and cons, too, for his Logitech setup. We mentioned some of the Logitech cameras. Hey, guys, I have had a Logitech Wildlife system for about two years now. It's a great system when it works. Uh -oh. Here are some pros and cons. Pros. Online viewing service via login.wildlife.com. Motion detection. Area-based motion detection. Which is cool. Yeah. You can select a portion of the image to trigger the motion detection, which is very cool. Uh, it's 15 frames per second, hardware preference controls via the computer software, password protected shutdown for the software as well. Um, cons, the oh. hardware loses connectivity frequently. Uh -oh. I use the USB power line adapter. Um, it uses the electrical lines in your home to transfer signal to your computer for recording. In an apartment or community living environment, it can be hijacked fairly easily. In a home environment, it loses connectivity frequently. You will spend some time trying to get this up again. It might be okay the first few times, but it gets annoying fast. If you can attach it to a computer that never shuts down, the router uptime is solid, and well, you'll have better luck doing that. Adam in Lake Orion, Michigan. Hmm. Textual viewer Justin had an additional comment about Zone Minder, which is one of the things I guess you and Robert. We mentioned. did. We recommended. I was going to say I'm not having blackouts again, am I? No. He says I have used many of the wireless and wired cameras that Axis makes, and I am very pleased with the quality of picture I get. And I have not come across a model yet that will not work with Zone Minder. As far as easy to set up goes, the cameras themselves are simple, but I would not consider Zone Minder itself simple to set up. We said that. Yeah, in Zone Minder is, is more for recording anyway, and if all you want to do is view the cameras, and this would not be necessary. I hope you have some experience with port forwarding, though, as you will need it to handle being able to log in from outside your home network into your cameras. You may also need a business class internet so your IP doesn't change and you don't get cease and desist orders about hosting a server since your amount of upload data make it pretty big depending on how much viewing you do of the cameras from the outside. Justin in Danville, Virginia. Frederick from Sweden also wrote in about the Axis cameras and likes them as well, but Anders in New York City has a much less DIY approach. He says, I've set up a separate Skype account on my iMac that I have set to auto 
answer in the settings. Then I have set my iPhone 4 and iPad 2 with their own accounts as well and put them as the only contacts available on the iMac. Then I can just call and look directly into my home, all for the price of nothing. Keep up the good work, Anders in Manhattan. Well, there is the price of the iPhone 4 and the iPad 2. But if you already have, you know, the device. If you already have them, yeah. Juan put in a good word for Foscam. To the twin babies guy, you should consider getting the Foscam FI8918W wireless webcam. Love those names. Multiple cameras are supported in its built-in web server. The amount of features on the camera will make you fall in love with it. Motion detection, email alerts, FTP upload, two-way audio, pan tilt, and even night vision. It's why I love mine. Head over to Amazon for more information. Juan from Texas. And finally, Geo had something to say about our drop cam recommendation. I saw your segment on cheap security camera systems. I have a few suggestions, and the first one is not to buy DropCam. DropCam is just a service and has a monthly fee. The camera that the service uses is manufactured by Axis, and these cameras can do almost everything DropCam advertises without additional subscription. You can set up alerts, trigger zones, and email photos through the web GUI on the camera. Uh, these cameras are also cheaper without the DropCam service. If $200 plus a camera is expensive, I would suggest getting the D-Link DCS 930 L, I think which we already mentioned, which retails for $75 on Amazon. This camera comes with my D-Link account. In addition, these cameras have built-in microphones good for baby monitoring. Hmm. Note that both of these cameras are wireless IP cameras, so no need for wire, and they can easily be added to any Android camera monitoring app, such as TinyCam. <laughs> Geo in Moreno Valley, California. Thanks to everybody who wrote in with suggestions. If Monty didn't already have his hands full of twin babies, and if you do, I feel for you. Yeah. Then now he'll definitely have something to fill his time with picking out a security camera. The nesting urge, it's so powerful. Yes. Yes. Hey, you got a burning tech question for us? Whether it's actually about burning tech, we've been there, or just a very urgent question, do us a favor and send it in. Techzilla at revision3.com. That's our email address. Or you can post it on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash techzilla. And of course, we're also on YouTube at youtube.com slash techhd. And Twitter at techzilla, <laughs> at Robert Heron, at Patrick Norton, and at Veronica. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Oh, and hey, check out the new Kindle ads. My cousin's in them. Really? Yes, my cousin Mark. Ooh. Hi. Ready? Shine! Shine! Three. Shine! <laughs> Three. Bam! Belmont out! Oh, I shouldn't hit the mic. Need cash for new gadgets? Gazelle can get you money for your old gear when you upgrade. Shipping is free on all items of value, and in most cases, they'll even send you a box to ship with. Whether you're upgrading to an iPhone, a new Android device, or other tech gear, Gazelle is a great way to get cash to upgrade to the latest tech.